Welcome to our very first of four midweek connection services. We're just excited to be able to minister to men, especially tonight. Next uh, Wednesday, it's going to be Pastor Patty and Pastor Don ministering to women. And then we're going to have uh, Pastor Tyler ministering to the kids and the family. And then the last week, we're hoping that that'll probably be the last week before this, you know, uh, sheltering in ends. Uh, will be Pastor Jordan uh, ministering. So we want to just do some great things to be able to encourage you as a man tonight. Certainly is not a G-rated night. This really is not a good night for the kids. I'm just giving you a little bit of warning. It's great for your wife to watch along with you, but uh, it's really not a, a G-rated uh, evening tonight. We want to just jump right in with a story. It's a story of a, of a woman who awakens in the middle of the night. But her husband is, is not there in the bed beside her. So she puts on her bathrobe and she walks downstairs to look for him and she finds him there at the kitchen table with a cup of hot uh, coffee in, in front of him and he appears to be in a very deep thought in a sober mood. She watches as, as he uh, is there and she whispers to him, why are you down here and not upstairs in the bedroom sleeping? The husband looks up from his drink and he says, it's the 20th anniversary of the day we met. She can't believe that he has remembered, and she begins to tear up. The husband continues, do you remember 20 years ago when we started dating? And uh, I was 18 and you were only 15. And he said solemnly, once again, the wife is touched to tears, thinking how amazing her husband is that he remembers exactly how long it's been. The wife is so touched at his great sensitivity, and she says, yes, I do. The husband pauses, and he says, the words were not uh, coming easily at this moment. He says, do you remember when your father caught us in the back seat of my car? Yes, I remember, she said, as uh, she began to lower her voice and sit down in the chair. The husband continued, do you remember when he shoved the shotgun into my face and said, either you marry my daughter or I will make sure you spend the next 20 years in prison. I remember that too, she replied softly. He sighed as he wiped another, she sighed as she wiped another tear away from her cheek and uh, said, well, tonight it would have been 20 years I would have been released from prison. Well, anyway, I just want you to know uh, marriage is not prison. You know, it's a lot better than a prison. We want to be able to have great uh, marriages. We want to be able to have great families. And uh, as we look in the Bible, we get some really great examples of what to do and what not to do. Not everybody in the Bible is the example of the right way to do it. And it's very interesting because we see that God is a God of a second chance. And uh, we're going to look at a Bible story tonight of a man that is very famous, Moses, in the whole Old Testament. Uh, there is no one that is more known than Moses. And Moses had a really rough start. In fact, uh, Moses was a murderer. And uh, before uh, he um, you know, thought that he was in control, he thought he would be able to solve things. He could be the master of his own life. He saw the injustices that were happening there in Egypt. His people were being uh, mistreated day in and day out. And so what he did is he, uh, he tried to take, you know, the law into his own hands and, and uh, he killed an Egyptian taskmaster. He fled. He's on Egypt's 10 most wanted list before they had America's 10 most wanted list. And he fled as a fugitive to a land called Midian. And it was there after many, many years that Moses had a great encounter with God in, uh, in a burning bush and God called him to deliver the people of Israel, three million of them, from the wicked taskmaster Pharaoh. But it's very interesting that on the way uh, there to that new divine assignment that God had given to him, that uh, Moses has an encounter with God that really shows his lack of leadership in the home. And uh, it's uh, found in Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 through 26. And I'm just going to read it real here quick here before we get to talk about it and how we can be great spiritual leaders men in our homes and learn like Moses did if Moses started off on the wrong foot 
I'm sure that you and I have started off many things in the wrong way, and we can, thank God, correct those things. Here it is. It says, at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. It doesn't say about to hurt him. It says about to kill him. He said, but Zipporah, who was his wife, took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. That's a nice way of saying she threw this, her son's foreskin at his feet. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. So now I have a question for you tonight, and that is, why would God w want to kill Moses? Why was God so angry that he was ready to kill Moses? It had to have been in a, a, a something that was a great offense. And you think about it. Moses had already murdered a man. You know, you look in the Bible and you see over and over again God's people failing. They built a golden calf while Moses was up on the mountain. And, you know, God didn't wipe them all out. And then you see the kings and almost at least half of them, they had some form of idolatry and false worship going on. And, you know, God's patience is amazing. Forty years. You know, he put up with the children of Israel, murmuring, complaining, griping about and whining about their, you know, lack of food and lack of this or lack of that. And, and it's just amazing how God was so upset about what was happening in Moses' life that in this occasion he was ready to kill Moses, while on those other occasions he was not. I believe one of the greatest responsibilities that we have as men as fathers, as husbands, is to be spiritual leaders in our home. And Moses had not taken the covenant of God seriously enough to actually circumcise his son. And now he was probably a teenager. We know that in Moses' life, he's 120 years uh, age when he died. The first 40 years he spent in Egypt. The next 40 years he spent in the land of Midian. That's M-I-D-I-A-N, Midian. And, you know, there's a lot of people who are living in a medium life. They're not going all the way with God. They're not hot. They're not cold. They're lukewarm. And I'm just telling you, men, don't be a lukewarm Christian in your house. Don't be a lukewarm dad. Don't be a lukewarm father. Be on fire for God. Go 100%. Moses had to learn how to be that spiritual leader in his home. Well, we're so uh, blessed to be able to have David Nico Hill here uh, with us tonight. And uh, we're going to be talking about being that spiritual leader in our home and, and uh, you know, what it takes. And I know that you've been an MMA, MMA fighter, one of the original ones. And yes, uh, tell us a little bit about what it took to be physically conditioned to do the MMA fighting and uh, all the movies, 35 movies or so that you did subsequent to that. I got asked uh, what brought me into mixed martial arts and martial arts and boxing, and I told everybody it was a rough childhood. You know, a natural progression of being beaten and then learning how to train enough to where you wouldn't have to worry about being beaten. So it started with insecurity, to be quite honest. With you. But there's a saying that you train all day so you can fight all night. And there's a lot of... Uh, training there's a lot of blood sweat and tears there's a lot of uh, using discernment of what you eat what you drink uh, where you go who you're with but that's only training for the fight before the fight you are absolutely obedient to the corner and to the honor of stepping into the cage or the pit or the ring right. but after the fight dr paul yeah it is nothing but bells whistles triggers images shadows voices and temptation everywhere right so um to truly be disciplined uh, a lot of fighters will train up to the fight and then the fight is like the epic moment the apex and then after the fight, win, lose, or draw, you're going to feel that pain. 
you're going to feel that swelling. Oh, I can imagine and two or three days after is, you, no, you have to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Yes, sir. So <laughs> the physical training was grueling. You'd work yes. out sometimes for 10 hours a day. I mean, I don't know how long would you well, work I mean, out. I mean, I'm sure you did doubles, triples. Yeah, you really don't put an hour on it. Yeah. In boxing, you put, you know, what's called uh, rounds. Okay. So you wake up and you, 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 uh, you get your uh, training in, you get your running in. You know, then, then you're at the, uh, the camp, and then you get your uh, speed bag, your jumping rope, your sparring, your heavy bag. So you go by rounds. So right. let's say if you're an amateur, you're fighting three rounds. But you're going to train 30 rounds to fight three rounds. There you go. A pro, you're going to train, you know, 300 rounds to be able to go 12 rounds. Now, before you were a Christian, how did yes. you deal with temptation? I fell right into it. You jumped for it. Absolutely. You saw, you saw something, you liked it, you went for it. You didn't even think about it, did you? Not even once. No. You were telling me a story last night that, you know, was really sorrowful. I know it was very difficult for you. Right. Uh, uh, and how, you know, you were so wired for temptation in your life right. that, you know, your mother, yes. you know, before she committed suicide, had talked to you. And, mm -hmm. you know, just, just tell us a little bit of that story. Because I think people uh, sometimes, you know, they don't realize what folks go through That's in right. their life and really right. just how, uh, how blinded we can be. Absolutely. Absolutely, Dr. Paul. You know, this are, this, it's really never easy to rip off the bandages and expose your wounds. But uh, to answer your question, you know, I grew up in a home where there was a lot of violence. There was a lot of abuse, uh, a lot of uh, disorder. And we know that God is a God of order. And there was no order in, in my house. And uh, so to make a very, very long story short, um, shame. Shame is something that it's heavy, it's invisible, it's painful. And it's like wearing a jacket full of chains. Shame, guilt, doubt, fear, anxiety. So... One day in particular, uh, my brother had told me that my mom was working for a suicide prevention program, which is, you know, the irony in that, and that she would not let my brother in or let my two nieces in, who two goddaughters, because she was fearful that they might bring something in that would make her sick so that she couldn't continue to work. She lived in a little one-bedroom um, apartment in uh, a challenged area of Los Angeles. So keeping that in the back of my mind for ammunition, a couple weeks later, I was just coming off of a movie, uh, Fist of Iron with Michael Work, Matthias Hughes, and uh, a few other actors. And um, I thought, well, you know what? I, I should call my mom, right? That's the right thing to do. Sure, absolutely. But I, I had girls wait, and I had a party to go to and everything else. So I was kind of weighing, you know, between the two, and, and I called my mom up. She picked up the phone, and I started to talk to her. And she was like, well, you know, if you want to come and visit me, son, you know, I can take a little bit of time off. I can only take about a half hour, maybe an hour off, but I'd love to see you. So I thought, okay, you know what, great, mom. And then I thought, you know what, oh, there's this beautiful girl waiting for me, and I want to go get drunk, and, you know, I want to go, you know, uh, go out there and... and, and uh, and do what I want to do. Right. Pardon. You know, absolutely. And uh, so I just kind of faked uh, a sneeze and a cough. And she, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, son. Are, are, you, are you coming down with something? I said, you know, not, I'm an actor. No, not really, mom. You know, I'm good. You know, I, I can still make it out there if you really want to see me. No, no, absolutely not. And, and uh, you know, the enemy's clever. He's, you know, he's right. clever. He came to kill, steal, and destroy. He's the father of all lies. And, and uh, so I didn't hear from her. I just said, you know what, Mom? I love you. I love you too, son. I'll talk to you soon. I hung up the phone. Didn't think anything about it. And then a couple weeks later, I got a phone call from my brother saying, hey, are you standing up or sitting down? I said, why? He said, well, I said, I'm standing up. I said, well, I think you should sit down. So I sat down. Wow. And, she, and he told me, he said, you know, um, there's yellow tape all over the area where our mom lives. And I went down there and investigated, and they said that she uh, took her own life. life. So I never got a chance to say goodbye. That's when I died inside. Yeah. 
Yes. I mean, I, I don't, I can't even imagine, you know, the guilt that, that you experience. Mm -hmm. but the thought is that you were so tied in to this world that, you know, even the love for your mother was second to being Absolutely. able to party, oh, party yes. with your friends. Yeah. So now you're a single man. Yes, sir. Okay. You, you have been married before you were a Christian. Twice. But you're, a single, yes. you're a single man right uh -huh. now. So I want to talk to the single men for a moment before we talk to the married men. Sure. Because there are single men and they think, ah, oh, this stuff about being a spiritual leader doesn't really apply to me. Let me go to another lesson. Let me, you know, mm -hmm. study something else. Mm -hmm. But it really does apply to you. Absolutely. Let's talk about what that means to be the spiritual leader of your home when you live alone in the home. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, in the privacy of our own humanity is where we either grow or we die with our integrity. And I've learned that. You know, you always think that, well, you know, nobody's watching. The lights are off. I can do whatever I want. And we're always being watched. The Bible says that we're a theater. We're a spectacle. We're always being watched. We're being watched and we're being judged. And so, you know, it's a false sense of security that behind closed doors, you can just watch whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. And there's going to be no consequences for it. Right. And that shame and that guilt and that pain, once again, starts to find you and starts to rear its ugly head. So, you know, my advice is, and, and I'll tell you right now, gentlemen, it is not easy being single living a life of celibacy, and doing ministry. It is not easy. It's not supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of decided, well, you know what? Do I truly believe that Jesus was crucified, went to the cross, has risen again, and he's coming back soon? And if I do, then I have no time to mess around. Right. In the privacy of my own humanity, you know, I've fallen many times. You know, with just the fact of there are so many triggers out there. You can't even watch regular TV, let alone cable TV, without every single possible trigger. And if you're single, what I would suggest is, and what I do, I would never tell you to do something I don't do, is you try to wake up in prayer, try to pray throughout the day. Amen. And if you see something you shouldn't be watching... You turn it off. You don't just turn the remote down. And it's funny that you turn the remote down, there's down. nobody there. There you go. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Like you turn the remote down, okay, so now it's okay. No, it's yeah. not. Don't play with temptation. No. All right, Absolutely so that's the not. bottom line is, you know, don't play with temptation. What you yes. used to run to, now you run from. Say that. And the Bible says, resist the devil, submit to God, and he, the devil, will flee from you. Yes, sir. So, you know, that's, it's very important to understand this. So, single guys. You are the leader, the spiritual leader of your home because you have to lead yourself first. Whether you're a married man or whether you're a single man, it's all about leading yourself first. The hardest person to lead is yourself. Absolutely. If you can lead yourself, you can lead others. So this is what I like to say is ministry begins in the home. If it's broke at home, don't export it. <laughs> don't go to the church and minister when, you know, everything's broken down at home, your relationships with your kids, relationships with your wife. You know, the dog doesn't like you. You know, you need, you need to get saved. You need to get right with God. If things aren't working at home, then we don't export it. We need to understand that Moses had a really tough start when it came to home ministry. Absolutely. I mean, the Bible was real clear that at the age of eight, this is the covenant that God gave to Abraham. He says, listen, Abraham, I'm going to put an outward mark on your body that is a representation of an inward condition. I want you to be circumcised on your body to show the cutting away of the flesh yes. in your heart so that you're not living a life by the flesh, but a living the life by the spirit. And, and so Abraham, uh, you know, circumcised his children, circumcised his servants even. I think there were 300 servants or something that were circumcised when he became right. God-fearing covenant. Obedience. Man. So yep. now Moses is well past 40 years of age. Yeah. We don't know how old his son is, but he's probably at least a teenager. Sure. And now, I mean, can you imagine going to your teenage son and say, son, 
you know, we, we need to circumcise you today. I mean, I, I have no idea what kind of family tension they had, but I guarantee you that that was not a happy talk. That was not a happy conversation. And, and his wife ended up circumcising his son rather than him. See, that's the pitiful thing that happens. Many times right. men, because we do not lead, our wives feel obligated to right. stand in our stead. You know, it's, it's not like, hey, you know, the, the president is, is assassinated, so the vice president takes over. You know, that, that's not an excuse. You have been deputized, authorized to be the spiritual leader of your house. Your wife should never have to be that. And when she is, she gets angry and frustrated. And that's exactly what happened with Sephora. I mean, she was, this was a mad, angry woman right here. She took the foreskin of her son and threw it at the feet of Moses. I'm just telling you, that was not a good day. I mean, if Moses was sleeping, it wasn't in the bed that night, it was on the couch. I mean, he was in the doghouse. And today, if you want to have a happy wife, you want to have a happy life, it's important to become the spiritual leader. Let's talk about some of those spiritual disciplines as we just have a few minutes Absolutely. left. Absolutely. Spiritual disciplines of how you can be the spiritual leader in your house, assuming you're married and have kids. But, you know, once again, I don't want to be somebody that is barefoot talking about what it is to wear shoes. I had two failed marriages, and I have went out with more women than I think 10 men should ever go out with. And that's just being truthful and living in Los Angeles and traveling all over the world and 35 movies and everything else but you know being in the world and of the world is a sad place to be there's no discipline there's no order there's no obedience you do whatever you want and so I always say to myself why is it that let's say that celebrities and actors and you know athletes and people that have a lot of money and basically have everything that the world says you need to have in order to be successful, in order to be happy, in order to be content, are blowing their brains all over the wall. Right. Because they haven't found that peace of mind that surpasses all understanding. And, and, and you know, God says that he wants us to be willing. He wants us to be servants, but he requires right. obedience over good. that. I love that right there. So we're talking about spiritual discipline. Yes. The first thing we need to do is to love like Jesus loved and lead like Jesus led. Absolutely. How did he leave? He was a servant of all. Math, uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 45. The Son of Man did not come to serve, but to be, to, to, not to uh, be served, but to serve. Sir, amen. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Yes. So let's be a servant leader. Jesus was washing the feet of the yes. disciples on the night that he was betrayed. We need to understand Absolutely. how important that is. We also want to lead by example. Don't tell your kids, do as I say and not as I do. No, you've got to really be the one that leads Absolutely. by example. Paul Absolutely. the Apostle said this. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. So, you know, we should be able to be able to have our lives lived in such a way that people can see our faith without even having to hear about our faith. You know, let, let your sermon be preached Paul, with I'm the tell life you, you lead. Everything you're saying... Is, is so transparent and so honest and so above board. And it's so, so important that we learn to understand that we know that the word never, ever comes back void. It always accomplishes what it sets out to do. That's true. But some of the strongest sermons we're ever going to preach is not only with the word of God, but with our actions. Because we're always being watched. Actions Believe be me, you are word. always being watched. Right. That's good. So your children are watching you. Your wife is watching you. It's important to, to be able to lead by example, praying, having time in prayer. Listen, initiate. You know, husbands, we love to initiate in the physical. Let's just be honest about it. I mean, <laughs> that just happens. Well, we need to initiate in the spiritual as well. Hey, babe, instead of like, hey, let's have sex. Hey, babe, hey, let's spend some time with God. That's right. Let's spend some time in prayer. Let's just, you know, let's just go into, you know, our our. Uh, prayer time and let's let's pray for so and so somebody's really suffering someone's really hurting you know let's pray for our kids let's pray for you know some issue that we're trying to work through spending time every day together in prayer is so essential the 700 club found this out they said that if a couple prays together every day and reads the bible together every day there was not a specific amount of time required just taking the time right. to pray and read the Bible together, that the chances of that couple divorcing is one in 500. Can you imagine that? Absolutely. I mean, one in 500, one-fifth of one percent 
a chance of a person divorcing when they are consistently day in and day out spending that time it's together. So I want to talk to you about good spiritual word. disciplines. Getting a devotional here at Ascent Church. We have a phenomenal devotional. It's called the Word for Today. Keeping a journal. I want to encourage you, men. Get a journal. Get. I, I have this great uh, book here. It's called Strong and Courageous. And I mean, it's just, I fill the pages of this journal with all the things that God's speaking to me. I keep a 52 a week, uh, once a year Bible reading plan. And I just check off, you know, day by day as I'm reading through the Bible. And uh, spending time with your family in worship together, not just at church. Make sure that everybody is together at church on a weekly basis, but spend time together in the home. I, I, I want to just uh, close with this thought. That when we lead, we lead with example. It's not about being bossy. It's not trying to be the boss man. It reminds me of this story I heard of a mild-mannered man who was tired of his wife always bossing him around. So he went to a psychiatrist and the doctor told him he had to develop self-esteem. And the doctor gave him a book of assertive, an assertiveness training, which he read on the way home. And when he walked into the house, he said to his wife, From now on, I'm the man of the house. And my word is the law. It is the final word. When I come home from work, I want my dinner ready on the table. I want, to learn, I want you to learn how to make gourmet meals and incredible desserts. Now go upstairs and lay out some clothes on the bed because I'm going out with the boys tonight. Then draw my bath. And when I get out of the bath, guess who's going to dress me and comb my hair? And his wife said, the funeral director. Well, you know, let's understand that we're not trying to make our wives upset or feel like they're being bullied, but we're wanting them to feel like they are being loved. That's the ultimate goal. We lead by example, and we lead by love. And the reason we love is because we were loved first. Amen. The best fathers are good sons. If you're going to be a great father to your children, be sure you're a great son of, uh, to God. In other words, you've surrendered your life to God. You've surrendered your soul to God. Your life is submitted and committed to the Lord. And the more that you're committed to the Lord, the greater that your children are going to have a spiritual love for the Lord and a passion for the Lord because they'll be able to see and sense that relationship that you have with God. Well, let's just, close, let's just close in prayer real quick. I want to pray for you men, and uh, thanks so much for being with us tonight in Midweek Connection. Father, we just thank you for each and every man, Father, for their desire, first of all, to lead by example, and to lead their family spiritually. And Lord, just like Moses had a rough start, Lord, you almost killed him, but God, thank you that he didn't. He didn't quit. He, he surrendered to you. He circum had his son circumcised, and Lord, he, he, he went on from there to become a great spiritual leader. Help us, Lord, to be able to be those great spiritual leaders, Lord, in our home first. We know that ministry starts in the home, and then we can take it to the church and to the community. In Jesus' name, use us, don't refuse us. Amen. Amen, amen. and amen. Thank you for being with us. You, Dave sir. and Nico will do a, a virtual yeah, high five or a fist bump, all right? Amen. 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 God bless you. We'll see you Sunday at Drive-In Church at 11 a.m.